Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter two. It'll be on the screen as well eventually here. But we've been in a series called The Wonder of Christmas. And last week I discussed and shared with you the wonder of his word. This week I wanna to talk to you about the wonder of his hands. Now, just so you know, that's an expression of God because God actually doesn't have physical hands. He is spirit according to the Bible. However, Jesus came in the flesh, right? So God in the flesh is Jesus, so God has hands uh, and through Jesus, but also God works through his people and angels so we can be his hands and feet. Have you heard that expression as well? So I just wanna make sure you understand, theologically, God is spirit. Now, if we get to heaven, we find out that that's different, that he does have some physical being, uh, you know, surprise, but I believe that's Jesus as the physical being of God as well. But the Bible uses this expression of God's hands, and I wanna talk about the wonder of his hands for Christmas time. And Isaiah 64, eight says this, yet you, Lord, are our father, we are the clay, you are the potter, we are all the work of your hand referring to the creation hands of God. Isaiah 48, 13, same topic. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon them, they all stand up together. How about a little different way? God's hand guides or gives courage. Uh, Ezra 7, 28 says, because the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage. In other words, this person had courage to do something. Ezra had courage. Ezekiel 3 uses this as well. Uh, the hand of the Lord was on me there. He said to me, get up, go out to the plain, and there I will speak to you. So the hand of God can direct as well in our lives. And in the birth of Christ, you can certainly see the wonder of his, of his hands working out all the details to bring us salvation. He was taking care of Mary, Joseph, uh, Jesus, the Magi, the shepherds, all for our salvation. So Matthew 2 is going to be the story of the wise men and the Magi. And for Christmas Eve, I'll talk about the shepherds. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 says this, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men, or you might say Magi in your version, from Eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law, so the Jewish teachers and leading priests, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Well, that changed pretty quick there, didn't it? First he's disturbed and now he wants to go worship Jesus. After this interview, the wise men went their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. Notice the star is still active. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with, with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Notice they only worshiped Jesus, not Mary. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Let me talk to you first about God's hand on the Magi or wise men. Now, depending on your translations, it's either one. The Magi were a priestly group of people who were from the uh, Medo Persian area in the east. And so they were Medes or Persians, and they basically served the king of that area uh, with guidance, and they would do priestly duties. And they often looked to the stars for guidance. 
So it's interesting how God's using star, a star to get their attention as well. But basically, there, there's a, a reason that this is very significant, and I really want to bring out this part to you, is how did they know that there would be a newborn king in Bethlehem? Because the star didn't say that, right? So there had to be some kind of revelation, some kind of word or prophecy that would tell them that. So Bible theologians and scholars have connected this dot to the captivity of Israel to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Could it be, perhaps, that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all the other young Jewish men who were taken, who were smart, and who served King Nebuchadnezzar, could it be that five centuries before Christ's birth, they had influenced these Persians so much that eventually their priests had read or knew about the prophecy of Jesus being born. Now, one of the scriptures that they would probably look at is Numbers 24, 17. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So the star could be, first of all, the physical star that they see, or it could even be Jesus, or it could be that the scepter is referring to the ruling of Jesus in Israel, so he'd be a ruler, all right? So I believe that the star could be both about Jesus coming out, uh, or it could be the physical star, and then the scepter is the rule of Jesus, this newborn king. So follow me here for a moment, and there's a few times where you have to uh, come with me on this journey because there's some difficult parts of this, of this uh, chapter you'll see here soon. But basically what we have here is we have magi who were influenced by Jewish uh, men that brought prophecy and brought scripture. And so God was using the word and a, a star in the sky, a supernatural sign, his hand, making this uh, draw the magi or the wise men to Jesus to worship him. Now this is amazing because the Bible says that the gospel wouldn't be just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. And so these men, these, these wise men are Gentiles. So already Jesus is reaching all people, not just the Jews. It's pretty fascinating. All right, now the star, many attempts have been made, you know, is this a planetary alignment? It very well could be. Is it a comet? Uh, is it a special star? Um, that's only come, that only comes at certain times. All these kind of uh, uh, supernova star has been thought of. None of it necessarily carries conviction as much with Bible theologians, but here's the thing. Can God use natural creation to draw people to him? Could God do a planetary alignment if he wanted to? And it shines brighter towards the west in, in Bethlehem for the Magi? Absolutely. But what's interesting is, is when you read through this scripture, it looks like the star is more supernatural because it leads them and then stops over Bethlehem. Can God do that too? Yes. God can do whatever he wants. And he's all powerful, so he can do what he needs to do to lead them to worship Jesus. So you come to your own conclusion. I mean, definitely scientists have said that there was a planetary alignment around 4 BC, around the time Jesus possibly was born. Um, so it's possible that that happened. But overall, I believe a supernatural phenomenon from God was there. And why? These men from the East would be looking to the sky for guidance for their king. And so here we have, they've been getting the word from the Jewish teachers over the time, over five centuries, and now they see a star, and perhaps this is the star we read about. Isn't that fascinating? That, all right, let me connect it for you. God knows how to draw people to himself. People who are far away from him, people who do not know him, people that are not spiritual at all, God knows how to get their attention. How many of you, God got your attention in some way that maybe is not the other way of everyone else? I've heard people say billboard signs got people's attention. They're supposed to, but God used a billboard sign to get your attention to come to church or to come to him for salvation. So moving forward, King Herod, who is this guy? Well, he's, he's a, actually an imposter. He's an imposter king. Rome put him in place 
as the king of the Jews, but he's actually an Edomite, so he's not from the Jewish line. And so when, when he finds out that these prestigious magi or wise men traveled from afar to worship this newborn king, born possibly in Bethlehem, do you think that triggered him a little bit? Yeah, it says that he got disturbed. Why? He's a little paranoid that his place on his throne would be taken by this boy who would grow up. Now, just so you know, Herod was very paranoid. Uh, he was an evil guy. He did some great things for the Jews. You can read about that in biblical history or, or in history outside of biblical sources, like Josephus could tell you about that, a Jewish uh, scribe and, and, and um, someone who recorded events for Jews. You can read about that, but more importantly, uh, he, was, he was very brutal. In fact, he killed some of his own family members afraid that they were gonna take his place on the throne. Um, when he was going to die, he created an edict, a law, a rule, that when I die, I want you to kill one person from every family in Jerusalem so that they will actually grieve my death. So this, that's, pretty, that's pretty evil, right? Now, they didn't follow through with that because they weren't crazy like he was, just so you know. But this is the kind of guy they're dealing with, and so he's disturbed. So scholars think that possibly the reason why Jerusalem was disturbed with him, because they're like, oh no, if Herod's upset, we're all doomed. He's gonna do something terrible. And so that's probably why they may have been disturbed as well. If, if Herod's paranoid about his place, then something bad's about to happen. Now, Herod asks for advice and seeks the wisdom of Jewish priests at this time, teachers of the law. There could have been about 70 in the Sanhedrin. And so they would come together and he would say, do, do you know about this? What's going on? And they actually properly uh, interpret it. Uh, Micah 5.2, the priest guide Herod and say, yes, there is a prophecy about this this child being born. Again, here's what the scripture says in Matthew 2, verse six. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you. He will be the shepherd for my people, Israel. So the Jewish priest actually properly quoted that this is the one that could be the child born in Bethlehem. What's interesting is they knew it, but they didn't apply it to their life. They didn't go worship Jesus. Isn't that interesting? The Jews are waiting for a Messiah to come. They know, they, and they, they even quote Micah 5 two. In other words, this could be the one, and none of them left to go with the Magi to worship. Only the Magi went to worship. So the Magi go to worship, but before they go, the Herod, he, he wants to have a meeting, a private meeting, and he says, when you find him, let me know so I too may go worship him. Why? So he can kill him. All right. Well, the hand of God worked and stepped in and warned the, the magi, the wise men, to not go back the same way. And so that delayed it. Now, what did they leave at the feet of Jesus? They brought three gifts, which is why we believe there, are, there were three that showed up. But we also believe there could have been a large caravan of people, not just three. They would have had helpers or servants or anything like that. But we believe, and this is basically what tradition has concluded, is that there were three gifts, so possibly there were only three that showed up to worship. There could have been more. Gold was one gift, frankincense and myrrh. Now, Matthew doesn't go to the length of trying to explain what those mean. But we in Christian tradition have learned that gold represents royalty here, and it was obviously a very... Uh, it was very helpful to have gold at that time. Frankincense has to do with divinity, okay, being divine and from above. And then myrrh has to do with suffering or death. And it's a balm to help anoint bodies that were dead. So they brought these three gifts. And here's what's beautiful about this is Mary and Joseph weren't wealthy. Is it possible that God, his hand of provision, okay, we're talking about the the wonder of his hands, that God provided resources for Mary and Joseph and Jesus. What do you think? Do you think he did that? I think he did. Now, Matthew doesn't try to tell us that, but you can come to this conclusion or infer it a little bit there that, yeah, perhaps 
God is providing for Mary and Joseph for their journey of life with Jesus. By the way, we don't know if Mary and Joseph, like in the show, The Chosen, locked away the myrrh and saved it for later. We don't know that, okay? But it's possible that they did say that, but guess what? They never had to use it because Jesus rose again. Remember, she went to the tomb to anoint. That was a clap, right? Can we get a clap for that? I mean, I feel like that's a clap. I saw a clap. I saw a clap. You know, they, Mary went to the tomb to anoint Jesus, his body, because to keep it fresh and, and, you know, preserved as long as possible. And he wasn't there. It's interesting. He wasn't there. So let's go on in our story, and this is just a fascinating story of God's hand of protection, too. We have God's hands on the Magi, guiding them to worship. What about God's hand on Mary and Joseph and Jesus? Verse 13 says, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. This is his second dream. The first one was in Matthew 1. Now we have another angel. You know what I just realized? Joseph sleeps a lot. You know, he must have been tired. No, everyone sleeps every night, hopefully, right? So once again, Joseph's sleeping and an angel appears to him in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Thank the Lord for angels. Think about this. Joseph doesn't know that. He's counting sheep. He's sleeping. You know, he's got a newborn baby, his wife's doing good. You know, he's just, well, now it's not a baby at this time, it's actually a child. I forgot that point. By the way, when the, when the Magi showed up, it says child. That represents an older kid. Just so you know, our traditional live nativity scenes with the, with the wise men there, we all know that's not true, right? Yeah, like it would just be the shepherds, you know, the first night, so to say. They believe that the Magi showed up about six months to two years, okay? And we'll see uh, some more evidence for that in a moment. But the word child is used instead of baby when we read this story in this chapter. Okay, let me see if I can get back on track. Okay, the night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary. Okay, notice verse 14. That night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary. I think that his instant obedience needs to be noted here because he has this child and his wife's doing good and this angel shows up in his dream telling him to get up and go because Herod wants to kill him and he gets up and he goes right away. Instant obedience. You know, God is working his hands, but God does ask us to cooperate with him, just so you know, all right? Like that wasn't just bad food, that was a real dream and an angel said to do something, you know what I'm saying? And so obeying and trusting and having faith that God is telling him, you need to get out because Herod wants to kill him. And he does. Verse 15, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken to the prophet. This is Hosea 11.1. 1. I called my son out of Egypt. In order for that to take place, Jesus had to go to Egypt and be there. And so he will eventually be called out of Egypt in this story right in front of us. Let's go to verse 16. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. Well, that's why they're wise. (laughs) He sent soldiers and, oh, I take that back. Who helped the wise men? God. All knowing God, wisdom from God, knowledge, foreknowledge from God, All at work on the wise men. Do not go back. God warned them in a dream, do not go back. And so they didn't as well. Herod was furious when he realized the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers, this is terrible. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. What a terrible thing to do. Evil, evil thing to do. God didn't do that, man did that. Just so you know, God's hand was not on that. God didn't do that. 
You know, a lot of people point fingers at God for when bad things happen. We need to start pointing fingers at ourselves, And we need to start pointing fingers at the devil. You gotta remember this, that in the beginning of time, the devil was trying to mess up God's redemption plan already, wasn't he? You think the devil's trying to stop this plan as well too? Yeah. So here we have it. The devil influencing mankind to do evil things, to try to take out Jesus, to stop our salvation, to stop Jesus from being raised and born. And now, now do you think he was going to win? Of course not. God wins every time. Praise the Lord. But because of man's ability to choose evil, here Herod killed boys that were under two years old. I can't imagine that tragedy. And that's why, and this is a very difficult passage to interpret. Uh, and I, let me do my best to explain it here. But this, this scripture is from Jeremiah 31, 15. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted for they are dead. Rachel and Leah are responsible for the 12 tribes of Israel. So Rachel had children, Leah had children, all right? And so this is not necessarily a literal prophetic fulfillment because this actually happened already in the Old Testament. Scholars say it's like a typography or I would say a parallel in a sense. So let me explain, all right? And this was difficult for me to understand, so I'm gonna to try to explain it uh, as well. But basically this already happened when King Nebuchadnezzar took the children of Israel from Jerusalem, the women cried. They cried over what was happening, all right? They lost their children, so to say, these young boys. So when the young boys were taken into Babylon, okay, they lost their children and they wept. So what Matthew's saying is this is happening again, all right? It's a parallel to the Old Testament prophecy and writings. It's happening once again. It's being fulfilled once again. Now, there's good news, though. If you continue to read in Jeremiah 31, it talks about the hope of them being restored, okay? And that they would come back to their land one day. It'd be many years later. Well, what we see next is Jesus goes back to the land that he belongs to. He leaves Egypt and goes back to restore hope and to save mankind. Isn't that good news? And so let's, let's keep going. Verse 19, when Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared once again in a dream to Joseph. I'm telling you, he sleeps a lot, you know. But this time, the angel shows up in Egypt where Joseph is. He says, get up, the angel said, take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. All right. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, once again, this is the fourth dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth this fulfilled what the prophets had said, he will be called a Nazarene. There you have it. So Jesus was in Egypt, he goes back to Israel. Now he's being sent to Galilee where he'd be raised in Nazareth and he'd be called a Nazarene. Now that's also to fulfill scripture as well. Now this one is a challenge too. When you look this up, it does not say literally, you will not find the words in the Old Testament that says he will be called a Nazarene. Now, I wanna bring this to you as a pastor because me personally studying the Bible, I went to go look for that. Okay, let me find out where the prophets prophesied that he will be called a Nazarene. It's not there. Matthew was generally making, was taking the general prophets, all the prophets, and what he was saying was, is that Jesus would be despised and rejected like a person from Nazareth would. Okay, now, now there's only one specific example where it could be that Jesus was being called from Nazareth in the Old Testament. And that's, uh, let me get to my notes here. Isaiah 11.1, 1, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Hebrew word translated branch sounds like Nazir or Nesser, which has the connections to Nazareth. So 
where there's this mention of a branch that shall spring out of Jesse's root, all right? The man of Nazareth, the town of the little shoot is what it's called. So it's prophesied that Jesus is this little shoot coming out of a dead stump, okay? Anyone seen a dead stump and something still grows out of it? That means there's life in there still. What Jesus was gonna be the life. It was, it was going to come back to life. Remember Jeremiah 31, how I said there would be restored hope and life and, and, and Jesus would bring that? Well, once again, Jesus coming out of this little shoot from a place that is despised and rejected, Jesus would come out of Nazareth. Do you remember in John chapter one where Nathaniel's being told to come see Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? See, this is what the prophets were saying that Jesus would come out of Nazareth and he would be rejected and despised because no one liked Nazareth. There wasn't much about it that was good. Are you following me on that? So that's what Matthew was trying to say. This is the one, okay, that's gonna be rejected and despised that will come out of Nazareth. If you see him come out of Nazareth, he's the one. You gotta remember that Matthew was talking to Jews and he's trying to connect Old Testament Jewish prophecies to his hearer so that they would believe in Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Awesome, you guys are great. So, because I was lost, okay? I had to do a lot of studying on that and I'm giving you the paraphrased version too. There is a lot of good work on those two prophecies. The reason why I'm bringing that up to you too is I wanna be faithful to help you understand. So if you're reading the Bible and you go, Ryan, I can't find it, that's a, that's a conflict in scripture. It's not a conflict in scripture. It's just that we interpreted it wrong and we have to understand the history and the surrounding of that, okay? So just keep that in mind. All right, so let me wrap it up with this. Let me, let me land the plane today. I talked about God's hands on the Magi, God's hands on Mary and Joseph and Jesus. How about God's hands on us? Now you gotta think about this for a moment and let's, let's, let's go back a little bit with Mary and Joseph. Brand new parents have a child at this point and someone's trying to kill your kid. It's kind of scary, isn't it? And now they wouldn't be strangers to dreams and, and angels because, well, that happened in Matthew chapter one. So they're kind of getting used to angels showing up in their sleep and giving them guidance. But they're going, they're having to pack their stuff up and go here, go here, go back, go here. It's getting kind of crazy, right? That's a tough journey, would you say? To be afraid of your child being killed and having to pack all your stuff up, your brand new parents, you're learning how to trust the Lord and follow him. That would be a difficult journey. But you know what I wanted to bring this to you today for? Is God's hand on them is the same with us. God's hand is upon you and your family too. God's hand is working on you and your family. God did all that, and this is hindsight 2020. Okay, just again, put yourself in Joseph's shoes or Mary's shoes. You're probably going, what in the world is going on, God? What are you doing here? And why, why is this guy trying to kill us? That's in the moment. We're reading the end of the story. We got the hindsight 2020 version. Can you imagine being in their shoes? Do you think God was teaching them how to trust and believe and, and have faith in his word? What do you think? Do you think he was trying to do that? I think so. And they passed with flying colors, all right? So I wanna encourage you with this first takeaway. God's hand is on our journey more than we know or realize. God is leading and guiding and protecting and providing for us as his children. He is working out his will for your life. Uh, let me tell you a quick story real quick. I, I um, noticed that my will bearings are getting louder and louder. And on Friday, I just felt prompted to start getting that book to, to get worked on. Um, but I don't, no offense if you work for a dealership. But I don't want to take my car to a dealership because I keep getting quoted like $500 more than your local mechanics, you know. So I'm trying to be frugal, right? So I contact a guy and he says, I know a guy. I'm like, great, I need to meet that guy. And kind of find out he lives right outside my neighborhood. And so I call him and say, hey, um, I'm having some wheel bearing issues. I wanna know if you can do those. And he said, absolutely, but I might have to uh, wait for a little while. My wife and I just learned that her aggressive cancer came back. 
And right away, I was like, oh, this is why God put this on my heart to take care of today. And so right away, I was like, all right, business later, prayer first. And I said, do you mind if we pray for your wife right now for a healing from this cancer? And this is the second time aggressive stage cancer. Um, you know, doctors would probably go, what are you talking about praying for healing? You know, it's a pretty severe cancer, but I felt the Lord say, pray. So we prayed for her healing right there on the phone. I could hear him crying. You could hear the anxiety before we prayed. You can hear the worry in his voice. And then I'm hearing him cry on the phone because this was a divine appointment from the hands of God to pray for his wife and to give him hope today. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Church, you know God is ordering our steps God is working in your everyday life and there's a reason why you're going where you're going or encounters you're having or even struggles you're having. And that brings me to my second point, that we are God's fellow workers. God calls us to discern, trust, and follow his plans at work. Like you need to discern, is God using this situation right now? Instead of going, oh, woe is me, what if God's trying to direct your steps to be somewhere or to do something, right, amen? What if we switched our mindset from, oh, here we go again, more issues, more problems, woe is me, to, wait a minute, God could be directing me to do something like that. And to trust him in those directions and to partner and work with him because we are his hands and feet. Can I get an amen? amen. Thirdly, you need to understand this, God's children are not immune, they're not immune to difficult journeys. We're not immune to difficult journeys. Our faith in God will be tested and stretched. God will allow us to go through things so that we will be stretched and our faith in him will be stretched. He will allow things to happen to us. And this is the promise that we have from scripture, Romans 8, 28. 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God is working it out. He's working it out. Do you love him? Do you trust him? Are you following him? He's going to work it out for his glory. What about Isaiah 41.10? I quote this often. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I love that, because if I have God on my side, things are gonna go a lot better if I didn't, all right? And I, he goes on to say, the prophet says, I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God's hand, God's power, God's might is holding you up, Isaiah 41.10. You know what we need to do? Fourthly, we need to remember whose hands we're in. Do you remember whose hands you're in? Because in the middle of the journey, you might start to just think and ask, God, what are you doing? What's going on? You'll never figure out God, just so you know, okay, in those situations. Can we know the will of God through scripture? Can we know, can we get an idea of what God's up to in the world? Yes. We just talked about that in our um, Discerning the Time series. God's given us heads up on things. But did I think that I'm going to call a mechanic and all of a sudden be praying for someone who had cancer? It didn't even cross my mind. Because we don't know all the God's ways and, and how he works and his thoughts, all right? So quit trying to figure out, and I'm preaching to myself here, all right? Let me get a mirror. <laughs> quit trying to figure out, Ryan. Quit trying to figure out, Calvary, what God is doing. Maybe we just need to remember that we're in his hands. And what do I mean by that? Maybe we need to remember his character. Because that's the most important part. It's not so much what he's doing, but it's who he is. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. He's a loving God. He's a trustworthy God. God never lies. He tells the truth. What about the, the nature of God? He is all-knowing. He is ever-present. He is sovereign, right? He's ever-present in those moments where, where he allows us to go through trials and tests. He's still present in them. He's not absent. Okay, we need to remember that when we're on journeys like Mary and Joseph or others in our lives, God is present. Instead of trying to figure out what's next or what he's doing, just remember whose hands you're in. Now, if you mess up, and if I mess up, that's on me. 
Sometimes our trials are self-inflicted wounds, aren't they? Well, guess what the Bible says about that and about his hand? 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Have you messed up? Well, join the club. We all have. Have you sinned? Acknowledge it and humble yourself. Come under God's mighty hand. Instead of trying to be God and do life the way you want to do it, which is getting you in trouble, has gotten me in trouble, humble yourself and follow the hands of God, right? Come under his hands where it's safer, that he may lift you up in due time. It may not be immediately. You may have to suffer the consequences of your mistakes. Maybe you made some poor choices with certain things in your life, and you will have to go through that. But in due time, if you stay humble, he will lift you up. His hands is powerful and mighty to save. Why? It says here, cast all your care, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And the psalmist wrote this, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, praise the Lord, his arm is not too short to save us, another scripture verse says. Don't you love that? Oh, come on, think about that for a second. Come on. He doesn't have a shorthand. Oh, this is funny. I, this, this, this is not even on topic. You ever been to a restaurant with someone and their hands don't come out to take the bill? You're like, oh, that's a shorthand right there. I guess I, guess, I, guess I got that one. You know, no, I probably, yeah, anyway. God's hand takes the check, you know what I mean? But seriously, he did. I mean, wow, I didn't think of this, but he paid the penalty for our sin. His arm is not short. He reaches out and takes that check. You got a debt? You got a payment? He reaches out. That was silly, but it kind of worked out in the end. All right. His arm, his, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. So listen, when you humble yourself, you will meet the love of God. Okay? If we don't humble ourselves, we will continue to be in the judgment of God. We will have to continue to suffer the consequences until we humble ourselves. And church, that's literally what happened to Israel. Israel would not humble themselves. And because of that, King Nebuchadnezzar had to come down and he had to remove the people. But somehow in God's divine orchestration, the great composer, there were Jewish priests or Jewish teachers who knew the law, who knew the prophets, who spoke God's word to magi and those magi spoke it to their descendants of magi and those magi spoke to their descendants of magi and then five centuries later, magi are looking for a star because a Jewish priest or a Jewish teacher said something about it. So in the midst of Israel being punished, God still uses it to bring people from the east, Gentiles, to come and meet Jesus, to bring him gifts and worship him. Only God can do something like that in your life and work everything up and around for, your, for his glory and for your good. <laughs> Only God can do something like that. And the same thing goes for you in this place. This is my last point. God's hands are working to draw and convict the hearts of unbelievers to come to Jesus. He, he, he drew those magi in. He drew those wise men in. I believe that they have something to do with the fact that there was the gospel or there was teachings of Jesus in the east. Okay? East of Bethlehem. I believe that. All right? Now, Here's the thing, God has probably been drawing you this entire time. And I've heard people say God's used billboards. That's, that's the point of them. They're supposed to, you know, they're supposed to get your attention, like I said before, but God has used people. God has used uh, people of God to bless someone somewhere and it gets their attention. God has used our shows. He's used services, online church. You know how many times I've heard people say, that they've been watching online at a church or our church. God is drawing people. He'll even use difficult circumstances to humble them and cry out to him, okay? But he's also convicting people of their need for Jesus. What does that mean? It can mean two things. Convincing them of their need for Jesus 
were convicting them of their sin, which is the need for Jesus. They work hand in hand. He will convict you of your sin. He will make you feel the sting and the guilt of your sin. And he'll convince you that you need Jesus because Jesus is the only one that can save us from our sins. And that's the story of Christmas. That's the story of the birth of Christ. I'll talk more about that next week on Sunday morning, but that, that's what God's doing. He did all of this to draw you to himself so you could have eternal life. So why don't we stand? Let's stand together. Praise the Lord. God is good. And all the time. Thank you for hanging out a little longer. I got the mic a little later too. Just saying. There's nothing more important. Lunch is great, but there's nothing more important than someone walking into the kingdom of God today, making a decision to believe in Jesus Christ. So I'm gonna ask my prayer team to come up, our pastors, anyone who's here right now ready to pray. After this service, if you need to talk more about this decision, we wanna make sure you truly understand what you're praying, okay? If you need prayer for anything, okay? Maybe you've been going through a difficult journey in your life. We're ready to pray with you, okay? We're here for you. We believe God is working in the midst of whatever you're going through. We believe that. But today, if God has been working on your heart, convincing you of your need for Jesus, don't resist today. Don't resist. If you hear his voice speaking to you, to your heart, that's his hand working on your heart to receive him. And I wanna encourage you to do that today. And we're gonna just take a moment to pray for that. So let's pray. And if you want to repeat these words, you can. But if you want to make it your own, too, it's important as well. And we can help you as well at the end of this service. Dear God, that's me. You've been convicting me and you've been convincing me of my need for Jesus. You've been drawing me to you Christmas isn't about the gifts, the materialistic gifts and things like that. It's about the gift of Jesus Christ. I see that now through even this story that you worked all of these details out to bring me salvation. And today, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I'm here. I'm coming to you now. You've come, you came to this earth. Now I'm deciding to trust in you. That you forgive me of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins today. Come into my life and by your spirit, make me a new person. And this isn't just a decision now that I'm gonna make I choose to follow you all the days of my life. Through the hard, through the easy, through the good, the bad, there's no greater place than being in your presence and following you. So today, you chose to save me, I choose to receive. You chose to, came to, this, to come to this earth for my redemption, my salvation, I choose now to trust you as my Lord and Savior. And I ask that, in Jesus' name, and I believe it done right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, for this church body, for all of us here as believers and, and brothers and sisters in Christ, God, we are learning again in this message to trust you. That in the midst of our difficult time, maybe it could be family struggles, marriage struggles, personal struggles, work, finances, purpose, your plan, whatever that we're trying to figure out in our lives, whatever's going on, we can be confident that you are still sovereign and working out for our good, everything that we need. And God, we want you to work out your will and not interrupt what you're trying to do. God, I pray that you would give peace and trust and confidence today that your hand is faithful to guide us and lead us, faithful to provide and protect. You're working out everything for our good. And we're learning again to trust you. God, help us during this season to remember all that you've done for us through Jesus Christ. 
to remind us that we're in good hands, we're in your hands. And we love you and thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, if you need prayer for anything, come on down. God bless you. Have a great week and we'll see you next week for Christmas Eve services. Take care.